Good morning, People's Church. <laughs> it is a blessing to be with you this morning here in the room and those that are joining us online. Uh, today we begin a brand new series simply entitled Saints. And I want to add a subtitle for this week, uh, Kingdom Citizens on Earth. Saints, Kingdom Citizens on Earth on earth. And let me tell you what my goal is today. The goal of the Holy Spirit is to start with Christ, to pass by the cross, to reinforce the fact that true citizenship of the Christian is from above. Okay? And then I'm going to end with Christ. I'm going to pass back by the cross, and I'm going to reinforce the fact that true citizenship of the Christ follower is from above. Amen? I want to warn you now that there are a few sharp turns that I need to make as we navigate over the course of today's sermonic voyage. So keep your hands inside the vehicle, stay buckled up, remain seated at all times. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> One takeaway that I would like for you to grab, if you don't hear anything else that I say today, is this. The true identity of the Christ follower lies solely in his or her blood-bought covenant relationship with Jesus Christ, period. Amen. Why is this important? It's important to embrace this because any other perspective is temporal. It's earthly. It's temporary. And you will never fulfill God's plans and purposes for your life otherwise. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we honor you and we thank you for this opportunity to interface with your word. Father, we thank you that your word are not just uh, syllables, Father God, and sounds, but it is life. It is breath. It is health. It is strength to us. It's nourishment to us. So, Father, strengthen us and stretch us. Encourage us and change us, God. May none of us leave the same way in which we came in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Saints, kingdom citizens on earth. Now let's lay a biblical foundation for where we're going to go today. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 through 17. It says, for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all. That's Jesus Christ. And therefore, all died. And he died for all, that those who live, that's us, should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, you hear that? From now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore... If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above. The King James Version says, set your affections, your passions on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Those are powerful passages concerning what the Holy Spirit wants to impart today and to remind us of today. Now, when referring to saints, <clears throat> people often say, you know, so-and-so is as pure as the driven snow. They're the kindest, sweetest, most giving person. He or she is a saint. But this mindset, beloved, is erroneous because it suggests that the concept of sainthood and the ability to become a saint is based solely on what we do. While there are some things required for a saint to do and to not do, sainthood is hinged 
on what Jesus has already done for us at the cross. You and I willingly embracing that reality and walking in it every day by the power of the Holy Spirit. So what, or should I say who, is a saint? Those that believe in Jesus Christ, receive Jesus into their hearts, and live their lives for Christ are saints, according to the Bible. Now, a lot of times that doesn't fit our definition, as I just shared a moment ago, but that's what the Bible defines it as, right? James 2 and 19 uh, was referenced many times throughout our works and faith series that we just ended, and that verse says, you believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. So the demons believe, but, but we go a step further. We believe, and then we receive, and then we walk out God's plans, purposes, principles in the earth in our daily lives. So a saint is anyone who believes no matter what their struggle with sin. Some of you have been disqualifying yourself because of your struggles with sin. That doesn't disqualify you. Now, now don't, don't, don't allow this statement to frighten you. I'm not suggesting that any of us is perfect, okay? We stumble, we fail, we fall, we sin. Say amen. amen. <laughs> we don't ignore our sin. We acknowledge our sin. We surrender it to God. We grapple with it, and we repent from it. And he forgives us. Amen? 1 John 1, 8 and 9 says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, he is faithful. If we confess our sin, he, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sin and purify us from all unrighteousness. That's good news. Hallelujah. So we are saints, not because of what we do, but because of what Jesus has already done for us at Calvary. Will somebody say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. You don't mind if I traverse through the word, do you? Because the Bible says heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will not pass away. Our opinions, they will stand, they will fall right? Our perspectives will stand and fall, but it's his word that eternity is hinged upon. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 says, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And that is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Now, I just referenced our previous series, which we just concluded last week, Faith and Works. We're not saved by works, right? But works should be evident in our lives. Now, some people get uncomfortable with that concept, but let me help you with that. Just substitute the word works with fruit. Substitute the word works with evidence. Is there sufficient evidence <laughs> to convict you of being a Christian in the court of law. Just kind of one of those mm, moments. <laughs> Today is July 4th, Independence Day in the United States of America. And as I look around my neighborhood uh, and people are pulling out the grills and they're already starting to fire off the fireworks, my wife and I were commenting on it last night. It's like, man, it's, it's like Beirut up in here. I mean, boom, 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 boom. You know, it almost feels like a celebration of independence from being locked in the house for a year from the coronavirus and, and being sequestered to sweatpants and, and video conference calls. I kind of miss the sweatpants. We celebrate American Independence Day on the 4th of July every year. And we think of July 4th, 1776, as a day that represents the signing of the Declaration of Independence and the birth of the United States of America as an independent nation. With all of its strengths and all of its weaknesses, America is still a great nation. And I'm grateful and I'm proud to be an American. Amen. 
Now, Americans are not better than any other nation or any other peoples, but during my travels to other countries, I've embarrassingly watched Americans act like they're better. I love this country, and I served in its armed forces. You want proof, don't you? There it is. That's my Army boot camp graduation picture. Now, there's a story behind these non-military issue civilian glasses that I snuck and put on before the photographer snapped the picture. I felt like the horn-rimmed uh, Army-issued glasses that are all the rave now made me look like Clark Kent. That, that's Superman's alter ego. If you know anything about superheroes and comic books and things, superhero, Superman is the guy that wears the blue uh, leotard, right, with the red cape. And, and when, he's a, when he's an earthling, when he's a human, he wears these, these glasses. And it was so funny to me when I watched it growing up because you can't tell that's Clark Kent, you know, but he put the, I mean, that's Superman, but he put the glasses on it and nobody knew who he was, right? So I snuck and I switched them, and my actions were not without reprimand, by the way. <laughs> now, why am I saying this? I'm saying this because some of the things that I need to share throughout the course of this message might sound like I'm anti-American or angry. As various people groups passionately protect their unique places within the tapestry of America, we frequently ruffle one another's feathers in doing so. Many people lament, away with all this hyphenated stuff, German American and Spanish American and, and Asian American and Indian American and African American. Can't we all just be Americans? Some of you might be thinking right now, that's exactly what I've been saying to people. But be sure to check yourself to make sure you're not saying that simply as a defense mechanism to avoid truly appreciating someone else's ethnicity, story, or struggle. Or using it as an attempt to avoid having meaningful and often uncomfortable race-related conversations. Sometimes I hear people sharing their struggle and sharing their story and grappling with the injustices of our world today. And people say, well, can't we all just be American? Yeah, we can all be Americans, but you got to enter into somebody else's story to really understand where that person is coming from. Am I making any sense to anybody? So what exactly does can't we all just be Americans mean anyway? It's a conundrum. And here's some of the reasons why. There are many different perspectives and experiences concerning America's history, and it can vary greatly depending on one's race, one's ethnicity, whether you're created male or female. There are a variety of distinctions derived from the lenses through which each of us sees. There's our earthly country of origin that impacts our perspective. Our ethnicity, what, what if you're in a multiracial relationship or, or family? What, what about gender? What about your profession or your financial status or your lack of employment altogether? It impacts how we see one another and how we see the world. What about children? What about if you have children? There are many who, who haven't been able to conceive, and, and they're viewed differently among their friends. They say, well, do you all have any children? No, we don't have any children yet. Oh. If you've got children and they act in a fool, that changes your perspective too. Because then when people ask you, do you have children, you don't know whether to say yes or no. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> what about political party? That's a huge divider, Republican, Democrat, independent or otherwise. What about patriotism and nationalism? There are some people that view this nation so high that they've elevated it above the cross of Christ. Now, if you're getting angry on the inside or you're getting agitated, perhaps you're guilty. What about people with disabilities? What about our religious denominations? I'm in a lot of different circles 
And I hear people talking, well, what is your denomination? Oh, I'm this and the other one. Oh, I'm that and our general counsel, this, that, and that. <clears throat> what it means to be an American varies considerably. If we're not careful, any of these tightly held earthly distinctions can become idols. Ouch. Therefore, throughout Scripture, God commands his followers not to make or embrace any idols. And he hasn't canceled that command. You still with me? Because it's awful quiet up in here. I'm not saying that we should ignore our differences. We should celebrate our differences. As I look around this room, I see a lot of different complexions, and I love it. Amen. From very dark to very light and everything in between. So, so, so the goal is not to not be oblivious to one another's uh, 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 container <laughs> in which we're doing life, amen? It's to celebrate it rather than to tolerate it. People come up to me sometimes and they say, you know, Arnold, when I see you, I don't, I don't see a black man. I just see Arnold. Well, that's what Arnold is, is a black man. You, there's no way you can come up to a six-foot, 200, and none of your business pound black man and not see black. It's when I elevate my blackness above my kingdom citizenship in Christ that it becomes divisive and idolatrous. Am I making any sense to anybody? So I'm not saying ignore our differences. I'm saying don't worship them. Avoid elevating them above the cross and our eternal distinction as citizens or saints in God's kingdom. James 4 and 4 says, you idolatrous people. He was talking to the people of his day. Nobody at People's Church uptown or listening online are idolatrous people. You believe that? <laughs> you idolatrous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity with God? Uh, it means hatred towards God, conflict with God. Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of chooses to be a chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. When I'm choosing to hold so tightly onto my earthly ethnicity or identification. I distance myself from God. What does idolatrous mean? It means being married to one while also in an intimate relationship with another. So when I'm holding on to all this earthly stuff, it can be likened unto the bride of Christ being in bed with the world. Whether we want to admit it or not, some people are holding so tightly onto this earthly stuff that it's hindering us from appropriately embracing eternity or a kingdom perspective. I call it idolatrously low living. What is an idol? It's not only defined as an image or other material object representing a deity to which religious worship is addressed. We think about little totems and little statues and things, but it's also a part of the definition of idol. Any person or thing regarded with blind admiration, adoration, or devotion. And sometimes that's a, people say, well, 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 tell me a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm a proud thus and so. And I'm this, and I serve over here, and I do this. And then Christians like seventh, eighth. But if you ask them, oh, no, it's up here, but you didn't mention it up here. That's a problem. Let's ask God for a fresh and an accurate understanding of his perspective on history. Because, I mean, American history or otherwise, because after all, it's his story. He's the creator. We're the created. He's the potter. We're the clay. He's the playwright. We're the actors. We need to tap into his story. What, what do I mean? What, 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 what does that look like? You, you know, you ask some good questions. One of God's greatest desires is that we enter into deep and intimate covenant relationship with him through Jesus Christ, and as a result, we live our lives 
consciously knowing and unashamedly living out our kingdom citizenship in the earth. When you go on your job, you're not just another employee. You're not just another time clock pusher. You're a destiny maker. You're, a, you're an atmosphere shifting, shifter. You need to step up in there in the authority and power and love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I got a friend who used to be the manager at a particular uh, branch of the bank that we bank at, and she left and went to another branch, and I go there now, and she's a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and, and the whole flavor in the bank has changed. Now, nothing changed about their policies or procedures or anything like that, but her presence made such a difference in that branch to where I'm actually considering maybe changing <laughs> and going somewhere else. It's, you know, I'm just grappling with all the millions that I have to move over to the... <laughs> Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. It says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Verse 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Remember Colossians 3 and 2? Set your mind on things above and not on earthly things. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Those who are, who are saints, are, are, that's what saints are, that's what saints do. His story equals his glory. If I'm falling short of God getting maximum glory out of my life, maybe I'm not really walking as intensely and intentionally in his story. Hmm. I mentioned earlier that I thought the military-issued glasses made me look like Clark Kent, right? Superman's earthly alter ego. Let me, can I just talk about that for a minute? Clark Kent was... Clark Kent was earthly. He, he was a human, long as he had those glasses on and, 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 and did not go into the phone booth. Remember, he used, some of y'all don't even know what a phone booth is. You're not old enough yet. Uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a box that about, was about the size your body could fit in, and there was a pay phone in there. And he would go in there, and he'd come out as Superman, like we couldn't see you through the glass, bruh. We, we see you. <laughs> but think about it. Clark Kent couldn't fly. Clark Kent couldn't, couldn't catch a, speed, a speeding locomotive. Clark Kent couldn't stop a bullet. Clark Kent couldn't leap over a tall building in a single bound. You remember that. You remember that, don't you? I mean, the, the cape would be flowing, and, and he'd be standing there in his leotard. Dun, 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 the old school Superman didn't even have no muscles. <laughs> I'm like, man, he can't do nothing. Batman didn't have any muscles either, but that's another sermon. Why are you saying that, Pastor Arnold? I'm saying that because too many of us have chosen to just kind of relegate our lifestyle and our interactions to this earthly plane grappling with earth stuff. Do you want to be a chicken just clucking around and pecking in the barnyard, or do you want to soar with eagles? If you want to soar with eagles, then you got to identify with the superman or the superwoman in you. Well, how do I do that? Well, God takes your natural, and he puts his super with it, and you tap into the supernatural. Glory to God. Glory to God. He talks about those that, that love him and follow him will do great exploits. Hallelujah. Can't we all just be Americans? Can't we all just get along? Well, we could just all be Americans, but for the Christ follower, that's setting the bar too low. The citizenship of the Christ follower is in heaven. I'm purposely saying Christ follower versus Christian because that word has been damaged in America. We use the word Christian, and then we go out and say anything, and we do anything, and we act any kind of way. Say, are you a Christian? Oh, yes, I'm a Christian. It's like, oh, I couldn't tell by your walk. So, so I'm purposely using a Christ follower. We're in this world, but we're not of this world. The citizenship of the Christ follower is in heaven. It's not of earth. Now, now watch this now. This does not mean that we should be unaffected 
or disconnected or uninvolved in the plight of the people around us. It simply means that we're from another place, anointed and called of God to impact and influence the earth for his glory. Are you still with me? First Peter 2 and 9 says, but you are. Who is? You are. Who is? You, no, you are. <laughs> you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So let me end out my time with four things to consider as we impact the world around us as we are on this 4th of July celebration. The first thing is that we ought to celebrate our nation. I told you before, with all of its faults, with all of its failings, it's still a great nation. I've been to a lot of places, and I, I'm, I'm grateful to come back home. I told you I served in our nation's armed forces. So, so, so we can't allow her issues and her uh, uh, shortcomings to cause us to walk around like some Grinch hating and always talking bad about the nation. Roll up your sleeves, get dirty, and do your part making it a better place. Amen. Secondly, we have to weep and mourn for this nation. At the same time we're celebrating, let's not forget that we got a whole lot of work to do. Passionately intercede for America between the porch and the altar. Because America still does some messed up stuff and has done some. From slavery, where blacks were owned as, as chattel and viewed as less than people, to even a modern day holocaust of abortion, legalized killing of children in the womb. It's got some issues. It's got a rap sheet, but it's still a great nation. And God has placed you and I in it to make a difference. So let's pray for its preachers. Let's pray for its politicians. Let's pray uh, for its people alike. Pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. James 4, verses 9 and 10. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. The great Frederick Douglass wrote a famous speech entitled, What to the Slave is Your Fourth of July? Many people wanted the slaves or, or, or former slaves to celebrate at the, with the same level of exuberance that they did. And he penned a, a, a brilliantly blistering speech. <laughs> yeah, I encourage you to read it. It's not all bad. He ends on a very high note and was a master uh, wordsmith and orator. I read some of his stuff like, man, I thought I was a communicator, but <laughs> glory to God. But I encourage you to read his speech while simultaneously considering the heart's cries of black Americans around you. Because although his, his speech was written in 1852, it sounds strikingly similar to what many of them are trying to articulate today concerning the fight and the plight to get a place at the table of brotherhood. This year's Independence Day celebration comes right on the heels of our nation taking a significant step in, in reckoning with its past by acknowledging Juneteenth as a federal holiday. Maybe some of you are like, why do we need that? And what, what is Juneteenth? We celebrated it on Saturday, June 19th. 2021 is a big deal. Juneteenth provides an opportunity for celebration and commemoration of the moment that freedom came for some of the millions of enslaved black people in the nation. It took the 13th Amendment to ultimately provide freedom for all enslaved black people and bring the nation out of the bondage of slavery. Both Juneteenth and Independence Day champion landmark victories and progress in our nation. I strongly encourage every American to welcome the opportunity to celebrate our progress while simultaneously accepting the responsibility to pray and to work 
to be the change we wish to see daily. Hallelujah. Thirdly, saints eternally impact this nation by walking out their kingdom citizenship within it, primarily in three ways. Evangelism, winning others to Jesus. Discipleship, growing them up in the image of Jesus. And thirdly, multiplication. And, and when we're multiplying, when we're making disciples, we have to be careful not to merely mentor people into heightened levels of allegiance to their earthly identities. I see that sometimes. There's a person who's kind of following or looking up to or being mentored by a particular individual, and all that person's issues and isms become their issues and isms. No, God's calling us to raise them up into the image of Christ to help them to tap into their new and eternal identities in him. Am I making any sense? Yes. Lastly, the people of God bless this nation as they bless God in this nation. We sing songs like, God bless America. Well, one of the ways he's going to bless America is by using us to bless him in America. We bless God when we do what he says the way he says to do it. Let me end with Paul's prayer for the church at Ephesus, set within the context of today's message. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 through 23. He says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparable great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realm, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion and every, uh, uh, every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. So, so, so may we walk in the fullness of him every day and in every way. For his glory. On this 4th of July holiday, let's joyfully celebrate the birth of this nation because it's a pretty big deal. But you know what's an even bigger deal? Being birthed into the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ. That, that's where our true identity and citizenship lie. So instead of placing such high elevation on our earthly independence, Let's ask God for a fresh revelation concerning our interdependence. Because in many instances, our independence has gotten us in trouble. Interdependence on him. You know, Jesus said that in John chapter 15, apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. Our interdependence on him, our interdependence on one another to advance his kingdom in the earth. So let's make his story together in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for encouraging us. We thank you for stretching us. We thank you for, 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 for causing us to think. Not that we're not thinkers, oh God, but you have a way of challenging us beyond our, our uh, tightly held perspectives, oh God. Thank you for strengthening us. Thank you for changing us. Get the glory out of our lives in new and fresh and deep ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. While you still have your eyes closed and heads bowed, if you're here today and you've never asked Jesus to come into your heart, this, 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 this Christian citizenship that I keep talking about can be yours. Jesus died on the cross for you. He loves you. He's got outstretched arms of love and great grace toward you. If you want to receive him today, would you just slip up your hand? 
If you're online, we encourage you to go to our website, peopleschurch.co, and just click the I'm ready to follow Jesus button. When service is over, Pastor Petros is going to be over here on your left. You can share with him that you're ready to follow Jesus. If that's you, I just want to pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for Jesus dying for my sins. Father, I am a sinner in need of a Savior. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, and I receive him into my heart now. Even though I don't fully understand what all that means, Father, I receive him in so that through the power of the Holy Spirit, he can teach me and he can walk with me and talk with me and grow and develop me, oh God. Help me to find a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church to connect to so I can grow in my newfound faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you for receiving me into your kingdom. In Jesus' name. Amen.